Please. Thank you. I'm humbling. Please, uh, please sit down and allow me to exhibit some of that nerdy sincerity the congressman was talking about. <laughs> I've exhibited that same nerdy sincerity on the uh, Daily Show with Jon Stewart, Good Morning America, Fox and Friends, uh, what else? Hannity. And if you guys notice, every time I'm on one of these shows, whether it's domestic or foreign, I always get my little chiropractic plug in there. Okay? So first of all, I'd like to thanks for, thank the ACA for having me here. And I will tell you that uh, Representative Kingston, who is the uh, congressman from Georgia, I spoke to him yesterday. And um, he regrets he can't be here, but he's talking to Leon somebody this morning, Leon Panetta or somebody like that. So <laughs> anyway, he's talking to the Secretary of Defense this morning. He couldn't be here, but he is behind 329, I, I can promise you. Um, <laughs> thanks. And Congressman Kingston is a straight shooter. He was actually at my Silver Star presentation ceremony and uh, made a great uh, effort to get there, and he was there when I was awarded that, so he's behind us. Um, before I get started, I want to tell you a little bit about uh, what's going on currently. Before I was a chiropractor, I belonged to a uh, pretty elite team that's been in the uh, media lately. Um, we've sold almost 500,000 books worldwide. That's good for you and me. Okay, it's really good for me. It's good for you too, though. The reason it's good, um, the reason it's good for you guys that were selling that many books in 17 different countries is that those of you that have read it know that I make a big deal about chiropractic care in the book. I tell everybody a medical doctor saved my leg and my life, but a chiropractor saved my quality of life. So I'm just as proud to be a chiropractor as I was a sniper in SEAL Team 6. You know, people ask me all the time, Dr. Watson, how do you go from being a SEAL Team 6 sniper to being a chiropractor? Most of you think that's a big jump, don't you? It's not. I'm still putting people out of their misery, I just do it in a different way. <laughs> anyway, this is my uh, favorite story from uh, Mogadishu, Somalia. Those of you that have read the book um, will relate to this. This proves that there's not a big jump going from a sniper to being a chiropractor. You have to sincerely love people. You have to care about people to do either of those jobs. Quick story about this little guy. I was running a safe house in Mogadishu, Somalia. Real quick, what a safe house is, is just a safe place in the bad territory of town, bad part of town, where you run agents in and out. My agents go out there and find out where these Al-Qaeda people are, the Habegeter clan, the bad people come back, tell us, and then we may or may not launch a strike on that position. So anyway, running this safe house, I kept smelling this horrible smell. I'm up on the rooftop at night, because that's when we did all of our ops at night. Agents are coming in and out, we're covering them, and I'm smelling this hor horrible smell. So during the daytime, I go down and try to find out where is this smell coming from? Can't find it. So the next night, it's there again, it's worse. So after about four or five days of this horrible, horrible smell, I'm like, I tell my guys, I'm like, suit up, get the MVGs on, let's go find out what this is. Well, what it was is this little boy right here, and I obscured the part of his right foot is blown off. This little boy was dying from a gangrenous infection, and we found that out because at nighttime, they'd bring him out on the porch and put him on the porch so that the family inside could sleep because the smell was so horrible. During the daytime, the reason we couldn't find him is they'd bring him in during the day when the people weren't in the house. So, of course, I call up higher authority, which in this case was um, the talk, and say, hey, I request compromise authority. Compromise authority is a big deal. What I'm asking when I make that call is, will you allow me to potentially sacrifice my cover in this safe house and the lives of my men to go render aid to this little boy next door? Well, at that point, compromise authority was denied. So we couldn't help him. A couple more nights go by. And I start to hear this moan coming. And there's no way I could mimic this. Those of you that have heard, God forbid, a child dying or somebody dying that's in extreme pain, it's something you don't forget. So I hear this moan, and then the next night it's worse, and then finally I'm like, to heck with this. Sometimes you gotta do what's right regardless. So I have my guys, four of us, suit up. Now imagine four guys kicking in your door Submachine guns, faces blacked out, black hoods on, and we come in and just like fan out, 
put you down on your knees, put handcuffs on you, put you over in the corner, and all you hear is your son screaming in the next room because we're scrubbing his leg out. Do you really think we're like God's delivering angels coming to your house or whatever? <laughs> so anyway, we do that. Of course, the reason we had to do that, so nobody's mad at Dr. Wasn't here, is we don't know if they're bad guys, good guys, whatever. We just know there's a kid dying next door. As far as all we know, they could be in, in league with um, Al-Qaeda. So we handcuff them, debrief the little boy's wound, give them a couple IV bags, a couple shots, and then cut their flex cuffs off and leave. Well, the next night, of course, got to do the same thing again. So come in, flex cuff them. Okay, this time their eyes don't look like two fried eggs like they did the first night, but you can still tell they're pretty freaked out. And um, so anyway, then we skipped the night. So we didn't establish a pattern. Okay, so we didn't go back to third night. So we skipped the night and came back in the fourth night. And when we came in that time, they're all on the floor with their hands out like this, ready to be <laughs> flex cuffed because they knew what, were com what was coming. So um, when, I, when I tell that story, I'm like, can you imagine? So on the third night when we didn't come, those people sat there all night going, okay, I know the door's going to get kicked in any time now. So the fourth night after, after we figured out they weren't a threat, we brought our uh, interpreter with us. So our interpreter comes in, finds out who they are, tells them, you know, hey, these guys are just here to help your, uh, your son and everything. And um, the reason I tell that story, other than showing you it's not a big leap going from a SEAL to a chiropractor, is to let you know sometimes you got to do the right thing. And when I went to the Pentagon to get my silver star, and Representative Kingston was there, I shook hands, it's all on CNN, Secretary of Defense shakes my hand, and then I get told, uh, Petty Officer Wazza, we got some other paperwork for you to sign. Well, I had to sign an Article 15, which is failure to uh, obey a direct order. And that was the best thing I ever did. I signed it and kept the pen. So. <laughs> so Part of my reason in telling you all this today, I'm going to give you a couple of parallels and I'm going to give you a couple of real world stories. That way when you go to the Hill today, I've got you ready, tactically ready, to uh, talk to these people that are on the Hill. Another little success story right here, cholera was rampant in uh, Mogadishu, Somalia, and if you've never saw a child dying of cholera, it's, that's pretty scary too. So we um, showed them how to purify their water after uh, we got some people in to vaccinate them. So when you see these um, people on TV trying to get you to send money to feed these people, don't send money. Unless we're sending troops over there again to make the streets safe, the food is still not going to get to them. Some other things we did, we apprehended the key militia, terrorists, and you got to understand, terrorists back then when we were taking out these guys, you guys had never heard of them. We, we didn't even pronounce their names right. We were calling them Al-Qaeda. Well, seven years later, we found out they're called Al-Qaeda, and since we didn't finish the job, Keep listening to me saying that over and over and over. Since we didn't finish the job, okay, that became an incubator for Al-Qaeda. And seven years later, the Twin Towers came down. And we stopped a food intercept. I'll show you a couple of pictures here. This, unfortunately, is just from a few months ago. You could not take these pictures in Somalia and have a child look like this when my team was there because kids didn't look like that then. We were getting the food to them. They were being fed, but we didn't finish the job. This is what happens. You've got to have some street battles, then they get the food. I think this picture was taken this summer. Okay? Every once in a while, you have a game changer. I was part of the ground force that went in to secure that crash site, and little did I know, that morning, I got back from setting up a repeater station with the uh, Christians in Action, what we called the CIA, and they're like, hey, we want you to go on an op this morning um, with some of the guys that are going to go out and do a hit on a hotel. It was about 10.30 in the morning. We'll be back by lunch. I'm like, easy day. Let's go. Well, what happened, aside from that change in my whole life, um, you find out about SEALs one or two ways. If things go really, really well or if things go really, really bad. The world found out about Howard Wasden during the Black Hawk Down book and movie because I got shot three times in that, in that uh, event. But you know what that did? That let, God, that let God let me know there was something else he had planned for me. I'm going to tell you how I was before I got shot that day. I was the best sniper at SEAL Team 6. I went to compete against the Delta Force guys quicker than any sniper had ever come to SEAL Team 6. In my mind, I was tactical God. 
I was Howard Wasden. Graduated in class 143, 23 people out of 136 who started. Number one and two, man, all the way through green team th during the SEAL Team 6 selection process. And I'm not telling you that now to brag. I'm telling you that now to tell you what my mindset was then. I didn't talk to people like you. You had no tactical background. You were not a tier one unit. You didn't have a need to know. And guess who I spoke to? A lot of congressmen up here on the Hill, a lot of senators, because we did CAPEXs for them. I'll get to that later. But I spoke to my guys that were around me because that was my elite core, and you guys weren't part of that core. Well, being hard-headed, can anybody here tell me what I thought when that first bullet hit me? I'd had buddies get shot on either side of me. I've had buddies fall out of a helicopter from a cave ladder that I had just came off of and almost killed themselves. I had 752 parachute jumps, never had a malfunction, not even a sprained ankle, and guys around me going down. So when that first bullet hit me, when this Black Hawk went down, can anybody here guess what went through my mind? Not, ouch, that hurts. Not like, oh, they got me, none of that. Disbelief went through my mind. I was tactical God Howard Wasden. I'd done numerous ops, always came out smelling like a rose. So when that first bullet hit me at the, uh, at the hotel, I couldn't believe it. I just got shot. But the second bullet hit me was a little more severe. I got shot first time between my, behind my left knee. The second one blew my right leg almost completely off. Didn't even feel that when I was driving a Humvee after I'd picked up some Rangers and put them in the back and I looked down and couldn't figure out why my Humvee was slowing down. And I looked down at the accelerator and there was this foot turned counterclockwise all the way in and a bone sticking out. Didn't even realize that was my leg. So after the second shot, I was like, wow, they're serious. Then, after the third shot, when I was shot through the top of the left foot, trying to do a link up, at that point I said, okay, God, I'm listening. What are you trying to tell me? He knew I was hard-headed enough that one or two bullets wouldn't change my mind or wouldn't get my attention. But after the third bullet hole, I was ready to listen. So, after Black Hawk Down, I come back to the world. And here's what I want you to tell your congressman today, your representatives today. I came back to the world with something I didn't even know I had and it's called survivor's guilt. I didn't know I had it. I knew I didn't feel good. I knew I was in constant pain for seven years until I saw a chiropractor. For seven years, I'd never slept all the way through the night. This survivor's guilt was eating me up on the inside, and at one point, those of you who've read the book know, at one point when I was sitting in my wheelchair, going through a divorce, which I deserved because I put more stock in SEAL Team 6 than I did my wife or family, going through a divorce, chronic pain, not knowing if I'm gonna save my right leg or not, just getting over a staph infection during which time I saw myself floating out of my body. I was sitting there with a nine millimeter weapon in my lap thinking, you know what, there's worse things than death. There are people coming back from the longest war we've ever been in right now, ladies and gentlemen, that have PTSD to a much worse degree than I did. Don't think they're not having them same thoughts. And let me tell you, when you add chronic pain to PTSD, you got a recipe for disaster. Even if the person is not suicidal, it makes you dysfunctional as a human being and assimilating back into society after being at rock star status and going to rock bottom, it almost killed me. It was almost the end of me. So keep that in mind when you're there today. And let me make that a little more personal for you. The helicopter that you just saw go down was piloted. Oh yeah, there I am in all my shot up glory. And I, I came to find out when I was laying in that hospital bed too, that a lot of times when you're not an asset, you become a liability. Take that message to the Hill today. These people were an asset while they're over there furthering this administration and the previous administration's agenda. Now that they come back, don't treat them like a liability. Give them the help they need. And I'll make this a little more uh, personal for you. Chief Warrant Officer Clifton Walcott, AKA Velvet Elvis. He was the guy that was in that helicopter who just got shot down. So instead of Hollywood just making these nameless, faceless people, let me tell you something about Chief Warrant Officer Walcott. We called him Velvet Elvis. Does anybody here know why we called him Velvet Elvis? Nobody read the book. Okay, we're still not educating people about chiropractic. Go ahead and play that for us, Dean.